I saw with breathing problems. He's, he's wheezing a little bit. He, he actually, you know, he has a, a little noise in his lungs. He's very brave. Every doctor I know who's worked in Haiti has one patient they remember over everyone else. For me, maybe because I have children near his age, it was Trevor, a 10-year-old boy. So he was under the rubble for one day, yeah. and he has a big cut on his head? He had a horrible gash in his scalp that went down to his skull and a terrible injury to his face. You can, you can tell right now, just already from smelling the dressing, that this is infected. His father and the boys helping me had trouble keeping the flies away. After examining the injury, I decided the only way to handle it was to lay him down. The cleanest thing I had at the time for him to lay on was a body bag with a sheet under his head. <laughs> I was able to clean and close the scalp injury, but the eye injury needed more than I could provide. I gave him antibiotics and dressed the wound, but he needed a real hospital. Fortunately, he was able to get treatment in a damaged nearby hospital using antibiotics that I obtained from the Project MediShare hospital tent earlier in the day. I have you leave a clinic for you. Okay. Lots of doses. I have you leave a clinic. Okay. Will that work? So we have IV antibiotics that you can give you. We give PPOT. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Frank McGeorge says his time in Haiti has changed his life forever. Coming up, a life-changing moment of my own. My family reunion here in Haiti. Coming up. They still need your help in Haiti. Go to clickondetroit.com right now and make a donation to Local 4's Help for Haiti. We've put a special link on our homepage, where we've also posted my entire unedited reunion with my family. This tragedy has touched so many families all across the world, including my own. You see, I have relatives here in Port-au-Prince, and when the earthquake hit, my thoughts went to them immediately. I never imagined I would get a chance to meet them amidst all this rubble. The big question, how to find them. All I knew was that my cousin Jean-Lucien Cantab had survived the earthquake, but that was it. The cell phone number I had for him wasn't working, and I was getting only sporadic emails from him before I left Detroit. Communication, as you can imagine, is tough in Port-au-Prince. It wasn't like we could call information and get his address. We decided to check my email one last time, borrowing a computer, and there it was, his address. Delma 60, number 34. No directions, just an email that said, look for the green door. Once again, we relied on our guide, Mike, who had an idea of which neighborhood to look in, so we took a chance. Navigating around Port-au-Prince during the day is tough enough. Now we were trying to do it in the pitch dark. 45 minutes and one very rough ride later, we found the green door. We caught you? Were you sleeping? <laughs> no. Oh my Hello. goodness. Hi, how are you doing? And We're doing as meet? best as we can. Hello, how are you? So as descendants of Celestine Noisette, Jean Lucien Cantave and his mother Giselle are my Haitian cousins. We were meeting for the very first time under very difficult conditions. Well, would you like to sit on the lawn, you know, it's safer? Yes. Because as you can see, the house is cracked. Jean Lou, his wife, and his mother are safe, but he did lose an aunt in the quake. We lost an aunt also, my mother's sister. She's a nun, right. and the convent, you know, was flattened. And um, apparently 15 nuns died, oh. you know, there. Jean Lou considers himself lucky. He was on the road when the earthquake struck. Let me tell you, my car lifted from the ground three times, up in the air, and boom, three times. And then it went like this, rolling from side to side, you know. In the meantime, trees are falling. High tension wires and, and posts are falling. Rocks are coming down, you know, from the side of the, the hill there. It, it, it was, I thought, my last day had come. Voila. The Noisettes are famous for their award-winning roses, the Noisette Rose. jean louis mother, Giselle, grows them in her garden, which wasn't damaged in the quake. What color? When they're ready to open, they're a pale pink, you know. A pale pink. But when they're in full bloom, you know, they're pink. 
The house was severely damaged, and Jean Lu and his family are afraid to spend a lot of time inside. So they're doing what every other Haitian family is doing. We fear, you know, some of the aftershocks can collapse it on our house, so we stay outside. Aftershocks aren't the only worry for Jean Lu and his family. He told me he sleeps with his Beretta right next to him, just in case. As I prepared to say goodbye, I felt better knowing my family was relatively safe. But life in Port-au-Prince is unpredictable, especially at night. What started out as a quick drive to capture the sights and sounds of Haiti at night turned into an evening we will never forget as we ended up downtown. What the f is Haiti supposed to do? What, 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 what? We weren't ready for it, and for the first time on this journey, our guide Mike wasn't ready for it either. Here we are at night on the street of, of downtown Port-au-Prince. And take a look, this street used to be filled with activity. Cars, you couldn't pass it with all the cars and people lining the streets. Business, businesses were open. It looks like a war zone. And over here, the entrance to the old iron market. Tonight, it's up in flames. It was Mike's reaction to this burning landmark that let us know this was more than just an ordinary fire. Mike as we drove through old Port-au-Prince or downtown Port-au-Prince, I saw tears just roll down your cheeks. What thoughts went through your mind as you saw the devastation here in Haiti? You know, in the days that we've spent here with you, we've, we've seen the palace, it's gone. We've seen the cathedral, it's gone. And uh, probably uh, to my fault, I was holding out hope that the iron market was still there. Uh, and it's, I, 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 you know, three strikes are out. And it was just kind of the, for me, it was the, it's tough to see. It was a sign of pride. Uh, you fly into Port-au-Prince and the whole right side of the airplane, you see the palace, you see the cathedral, and you see the iron market. And uh, Can't, you can't look out your window and see those anymore. You, you don't see them. They're gone. How much more can Haiti take? I talk to you and you talk to Detroit and Detroit talks to Michigan and, you know, things can happen. Things can change. It's going to take Haiti a, 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 on a good day. Haiti had a tough time taking care of herself. Uh, I think I'm seeing Haiti on its worst day, and I don't know. I don't know. Only an act of God could reduce this to rubble. Bruised and broken, maybe. A mere shell of itself, perhaps. But somehow, some way, Haiti is still standing. Yes, it's going to take a lot of time and a lot of money. But for those who think that this is the end, don't count on it. In the words of a friend, you can dust Haiti off your shoes, but you can never wash Haiti out of your heart. Oh, mon Dieu, Haïti en day, I've shot a movie.